Today is November the 15th, 2011. My name is Tanya Fincham, along with Juliana Nicolasian. We're with the OSU Oklahoma State University Library, and we're doing an oral history project called Centennial Farm Families. And today we're in Vanita, Oklahoma. Today we have with us Jay Franklin, Judy McBee, and Carol Pixley. Okay. So let's start with having you explain to us how your family initially came to have this piece of land. Uh, the Franklins had ended up, uh, well, had migrated across through Illinois over to Shawnee Mission, Kansas. Uh, George, who is our great-great-grandfather, uh, married Elisha Pumpkin, full-blood Shawnee. And that gave him the ability to uh, come down here on a lease. And uh, 1863, if I recall, is when they landed at Narciss. Uh, George had been a wagon freighter and uh, had always camped uh, right here. Uh, there's a spring in this creek that uh, was his favorite watering hole. So. Uh, then as soon as he could, he moved down here uh, to this side in 1872. And um, uh, then the first deedings happened with the uh, Dawes Commission. Uh, uh, the, uh, I should have should have drug those deeds out. But uh, anyway, we still have the original Dawes Commission deeds uh, for those parcels. Uh, they were 40 acre tracks. Uh, deeded to George and his three sons and um, anyway we still we still have all the original Dawes land and then of course it's expanded somewhat from that point. Was it 40 per person then? Correct. So it totaled 40 160 acres. then? Uh -huh. And what tribe? Shawnee. Shawnee. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Dawes Commission process where uh, we were they were adopted Cherokees. Uh, Shawnees were not organized, so uh, uh, the Cherokees allowed them into the role as adopted. And uh, in fact, our our tribal guards all say Cherokee parentheses adopted Shawnee on it. Well, then track the lineage from George and how it how it came to be the three of you. Uh, George to Francis Marion, is that right? Uh, I have to defer to Judy because she remembers these facts better than I do. Uh, Francis Marion, um, let's see, let me back up a minute. Um, George had one son uh, that uh, in the 1890s, went, he didn't like dirt farming, so he left this side of Anita and moved about the same distance to the west side of Anita. <coughs> and, uh, but then uh, Francis Marion uh, stayed here. Francis Marion was Fred's uh, father. Fred's son was, was uh, Robert, and, uh, and we're Robert's children. And what was initially farmed here? It, it initially started uh, as cattle, and, um, um, but then fairly soon became a crop farm, or diversified as everything was at that point. Um, and I didn't realize until Judy just drug up a sheep picture. I never knew there were any sheep on the place until I saw that one. But, uh, uh, but uh, hogs, dairy, uh, beef, and then uh, virtually every crop. Uh, in that period of time, uh, crop diversity was much greater than it is now because limited manpower, limited machinery, limited horsepower, and so they were farming smaller quantities of each crop to diversify the, the uh, time. And um, uh, barley, oats, uh, flax, uh, our dad raised some cotton here. Uh, which was kind of unusual and was kind of a, a shot in the, in the, or flash in the pan, I guess I should say. And, and that was kind of a, uh, uh, at 
least I have the impression that he snuck the cotton in and, <laughs> and uh, our mother never knew about it because she was raised at Rush Springs and drove a cotton sack her whole childhood. So uh, I don't think she saw the cotton till it was up. But uh, uh, anyway, during the war, he raised, uh, raised blacks uh, as well. And, and uh, <laughs> remember him telling stories about flax that handles almost like water. Uh, he, he said the stuff would almost run uphill if you weren't careful. When you, when you pulled out of the field with a wagon or a truck, it just splashed out like water. It was so slick. And uh, anyway, so, uh, uh, but all through, all through the history, it's been, it's been uh, generally a mix of, of livestock and crops, although currently it's crops only. When I was a small child, early 50s, uh, we had one horse, so corral cattle, which usually ran about 50 head of cattle. And I remember that he had one field of oats and that largely was to keep the horse going through the winter. He would have some barley and then that would transition into wheat, corn, most years, and then later he started growing the Milo, and uh, I'm not sure he even started soybeans before I was grown. Do you know what year he started soybeans? Oh, I think soybeans have been around quite a while, but he didn't raise very many because um, there were a lot of issues with, with southern soybeans in, in that period of time, uh, shatter, difficult harvest, and so forth. Uh, the corn left in the uh, mid 50s when hybridization came along, uh, grain sorghum became the preferable crop because it's more acclimated here. And then there wasn't any corn here until about 2000, and then we got some good southern varieties, and then corn replaced grain sorghum again. So grain sorghum is virtually gone in this area, corn's back. Mm -hmm. What were some of the original structures on, on the farm? <laughs> this leaning barn uh, right behind the house uh, was built in 1872. Um, the uh, What, half the length it was and had a shed on the side of it? Uh, yeah, it, it was twice as long, I think, initially. Um, there were then we can three remember granaries in there. Uh, uh, in our time, there was a shed to the west that was a milking parlor, and then there was a long shed that ran across the north end. I'm sorry, shed to the east. A long shed that ran to the east that was a uh, uh, calf hutch and so forth for dairy. But uh, at one time, the barn is half as big as it originally was, and, it, and at one time it was probably five times as big as it is now. Then uh, uh, <laughs> the uh, uh, I never knew her grandmother, but uh, supposedly she always complained that every picture that was ever taken of this place had that old <laughs> barn, barn <laughs> and she wanted it torn down. And she died in '53. <laughs> <laughs> and my mother wanted it torn down constantly, and uh, uh, so Dad would accommodate her by taking down a piece of it. <laughs> and um, uh, within a year of uh, her passing away, she was asking me when I was going to get that barn out of there. And uh, I waited her out. And anyway, that was uh, five years ago. <laughs> yeah, we. Uh, uh, and I keep hoping that I'll find the time to start gently pulling it back up straight and try to preserve it. But um, anyway, but for. 65 years, 70 years, and yeah, longer than that, probably 80 years, that barn's been cussed and to be removed. And, uh, so then, your grandparents had a house on this piece? Yes, this is, this is the third house, isn't that right? Mm -hmm. uh, or fourth. Didn't two burn, one move oh, away? Well, I knew about one that got burned. Is that 36? Six. I think one... I remember I one burnt before the turn of the century, then they were I don't know anything about that. I this is either the third or the fourth house. This one was built in 1950. 
a little after that, wasn't it? I think it was. I thought it was after I was born. They started. I think that's probably right. I think it probably started in 51. Mm -hmm. uh, one house has moved away and it still is in use uh, two miles from here. And then uh, at least one house, but I think two houses uh, uh, stood there before that burned. Uh, the more recent of those two he's talking about, those cedar trees that are standing there, there used to be four of them in a pattern, and you walk up between the middle of them to the front of the house that burned. And then they moved in this little house he was talking about that has been moved again after that. And um, I can remember living in it. I can remember being awakened in that house to be taken up to the neighbors the night she was born. I can remember once she was born, she got the baby bed and I slept on the couch right beside the door. And I can remember one winter when it was just awfully, 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 awfully cold. Daddy had gone out to do chores and came in and opened that door and my head was right there by the door and I can still remember just how br brutal cold it was coming in that door. But it was this little house that had a little living room, little place to eat, bedroom and kitchen behind it so then this one got built after she came along and we needed more space our dad lived here all but six months of his life uh, while that house she's talking about was being built prior to this one uh, moved five miles away uh, while that house was being built but uh, other than that he was born here and, and uh, and, used to talk uh, about in the dining area of that house that's standing that you know that's about where i was born and the uh little house that i remember sat over part of what had been burned before and so when that went away as a child i'd find all sorts of broken china and all sorts of bits of things out of that burned house that had been covered up those years by the house that we lived in before this one was built. So. Well, when did electricity come to the... Uh, shortly after uh, Rural Electrification Act, uh, it, it got here fairly quickly. Um, the more interesting story, though, I think is, is uh, the telephone line was running down the highway and uh, and uh, dad ran a, his own telephone line down from the highway down to this house. Uh, this, uh, this barn, uh, uh, I can remember when it ran off of a single wire, uh, uh, it grounded back through the ground. Uh, there was just a hot wire coming out here and uh, uh, so, but anyway, in, in the late thirties, I'm sure, uh, we were, we were powered. Um, <laughs> but, uh, there was, uh, I think I've got it all gone now, but there was a lot of single wire electrification around this place, uh, which, which was fully functional, uh, but, uh, not very fire safe or or shock safe, but uh, delivered power. Uh, the hot wire went, everything else returned through the ground on the ground rods, which was fine as long as the soil was damp and the ground rod was deep. And, uh, I was just curious that you say it was cold. How was that house heated at, at the time you were sleeping by the door? Boy, I suppose that cold well, was that stove was in there? there? Yeah. I'll bet it, it was been. because when we built this house, it was all again. That wasn't new, I don't think, when it came up, but I can't remember where that was in that house. I don't remember that. Uh, no fireplace. The, no. Mm -mm. the floor furnaces weren't. Oh, you don't remember the, the kerosene stove? Oh, oh no. no. Sometimes we. It was, I don't know, this big square <laughs> stood yay tall and in then the corner of the living room. You know where the little stove in the kitchen now mm -hmm. vents in? Well, it vented in from the other side, sat in that corner. And 
So you just first heat. remember the, the fireplace, I mean the furnace. Yeah, because so. they were put in either my first or second grade year. Okay. So he was still. Propane floors, first thing yeah. I remember. Uh, had and a small floor in this house then, in the mid-50s, small floor furnace in the living room, and then one that sat in the back hallway outside the back bedroom. And then I don't know when they went central. Uh, 70. Six. Three or four. Oh, was it six? Yeah. I thought it was a little sooner than that because I. It was 76. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I was a slow learner. These uh, steel grates on the floor furnaces, I had a lot of wobble foot for Me that. too. Because <laughs> you'd wake up and the house would be cold, so you'd go stand straddling that thing. <laughs> also, the bottoms of our house shoes were always kind of pretty badly used. <laughs> One year I got. A basketball for Christmas and allowed it to roll onto the furnace. Oh. No more. <laughs> so I didn't even have it. It wasn't dangerously hot, but it would put marks on your feet. <laughs> You've respected it when you're. <laughs> they, uh, this house had an addition built in 1976 out to the front, and um, uh, one of the REC programs was total electric. So when they did that. Uh, Deal. There was a rebate for the central heat and air if they would take the propane furnaces out, and they did. Within two years, they wish they hadn't taken the rebate because uh, electricity was terribly high. The heating bill on that house is really expensive still. Well, your grandparents lived here, and then your parents lived here. Were, did they overlap that time period? Uh, no. Uh, grand. Every generation, uh, until me, uh, every generation would move to town and the next generation would live here. Uh, Great-great-grandfather moved to Bonita. Uh, Great-grandfather moved to Bonita. Grandfather moved to Bonita. Uh, my folks toughed it out. <laughs> I, lived you in, move. I lived in Bonita. <laughs> so, anyway. Um, but, um, yeah, as each... Um, uh, you know, the six months is correct. Four months to build the house. Two months, uh, our parents lived in uh, oh, a I forgot little about cottage. That. What did they call that? The honeymoon? The honeymoon suite. Yeah, yeah. something like that. Uh, halfway between here and the highway, a neighbor's little house is where they first the moved. The hen's house, wasn't it? Yes. Yes. While, I while that. our grandparents were getting organized to move to Veneta, the, uh, they lived for a couple of months, just a quarter mile up the road. Well, did your grandfather have siblings? No. Well, no. that's not the end of it. So, what, did your father have siblings? No. no. Okay, so just trying to. Well, well grandfather, no, grandfather did. Grandfather, grandfather had did. siblings. Yeah. yeah. Daddy did. Yeah. Yes. Daddy was old. Um, grandfather, uh, another Francis, uh, Francis B, was a brother. Um, I have to pull that picture out of my office. Luther, Francis, Fred, Bess, Frank, Katie, and John. Yeah, uh, this is this is uh, grandfather and his brother Frank. Frank farmed on the opposite side of the highway. They were uh, they were uh, delivering that uh, team to uh, that sold it. Uh, Frank was kind of uh, the lead on the. Uh, on the horse industry, but uh, uh, they raised a lot of, of uh, 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 draft horses and then some light draft horses as well. But anyway, uh, that land was on the other side of the highway. Well, part of it was on this side as well, but Uncle Frank had had uh, uh, put together and um, uh, then our folks bought part of Uncle Frank's, and then I bought part of Uncle Frank's. Um, actually, uh, our parents bought two different parcels. Uh, there was a 60 on this side of the highway, just as soon as you turn off. And then, uh, then they bought a place on the west side of the section line, and then I bought the place on the east side of the section. So we've- uh, When our grandfather's brother was living that place, they had an only child, a girl, it was pretty much daddy's age. So they functionally were kind of brother and sister. Mm -hmm. 
I was just trying when there's siblings, you wonder how the one ended up with the property and the other didn't. So I was mm -hmm. trying to get some clarification uh, uh, there. The, um, the other brothers didn't farm. They all had different careers. So they were just Fred, our grandfather, and, and Frank that farmed. And then Frank peeled off in the 50s. Uh, no, earlier than that. Uh, Frank kept the place, had a tenant farmer uh, from the 30s clear through uh, to what, early 70s when SB retired from it, I guess. Yeah. Well, he, uh, a deer. He died during the early 60s, didn't he? No, oh, I wouldn't Frank, remember. He was trying to say Frank, when, when SB retired. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you were talking about my Uncle Frank. Uh, I, mean, I never knew Uncle Frank, but I just think about SB. An old family friend, SB Wade, who had, his family had grown up just on the south side of Uncle Frank in the south end of that section across the road. And uh, this uh, Samuel Busey, SB Wade, uh, then worked for our great uncle Frank. Uh, he uh, uh, actually, we want to grass off into the crowd. I don't know how far they want to grass. Uh, I guess they can edit. Yeah, you can, take this, you can take this back out. I'm backing up to talking about where uh, uh, the next generation living here and the other generation moving off. During Depression times, uh, this great uncle Frank uh, was uh, working for the Travelers Insurance Company. And um, uh, Travelers had loaned, a, had a lot of real estate loans out, farm loans out. And um, antitrust laws would not allow a corporation to own any real estate. So Uncle Frank, our grandfather, uh, we mentioned Ants, Jim Ants, who owned this where this house is that you turn. That's the only corner we don't own up there. Uh, uh, he was a cousin. So Jim Entz, our grandfather, our great uncle, formed what was called Prospect Company, which was backed by travelers uh, to hold uh, the um, real estate holdings that, that uh, they had to take back during the Depression. So the three of them, uh, from Oklahoma, at least through Colorado, um, uh, these three brothers were responsible. They actually, they actually held title, but they were backed by travelers, and um, uh, so they were managing all these farms. And Travelers was a really benevolent organization. They did everything they could to keep those farms in the farmers' hands, uh, leased it back to them, anyone that was willing to stay and fight it. And then, and the vast majority of that land ended up back in the original owner's hands again, uh, post depression. But anyway, so these three brothers uh, were running this prospect company, was the name of it, that uh, was managing all this land for travelers. And uh, I remember Dad talking about the, the uh, uh, they all had brand new Buicks provided by travelers, you know, and they were. They were pretty impressive during the Depression. They, they were wheeling around brand new Buicks. They, uh, uh, they carried their clothes and they carried their saddles with them and uh, would just take off. When they'd get there, they'd saddle up somebody's horse and do their inspections and come back. But, uh, uh, but uh, a little bit of old Western tradition, they didn't go anywhere without their own saddle. Uh, anyhow. So that's how you supplemented the farm at that point during this. Well, no, they were completely independent okay. away from it. Uh, like I say, great uncle Frank, he had a he had a farm operator, and then and then our dad was farmer, independent of granddad. Uh, the, the The transition had been made at that point. Well, as children, what are some of the chores you had? If any. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, Carol, we can start with you. Well, because I wasn't quite as mobile as the other, at the, as the others, I probably did more things inside the house. I did tag along with Judy to feed the chickens sometimes, just 
for the novelty of it, but it wasn't my everyday job. Um, you folded clothes. Folded clothes, washed dishes, dusted, vacuum. So. Always had fair sized garden and yeah, so help with some of the garden things. Mapping beans and uh, peas. Jelly peas. Jelly peas. <laughs> peas. <laughs> washed lots of cucumbers and okra. All that, you know, just helping prepare things for canning or freezing. Um, and my least favorite part of all that was when I had to shove the corn. Oh, yeah. Out Flies. In the backyard. And of course, and all that stuff sticky. sticky on your Ugh. hands. No place to wash up. Very handy. It was just messy. Once I was in early grades, maybe fourth, third, fourth grade, I was in 4-H. And every year we'd get 50 chicks to be my project. And then once they... I, you know, feed them up through all that time, but even once they were kept, some of them for laying hens, I still feed the chicken sometimes, gather the eggs. And once I was older, um, for a brief period, do you know how long was they had the dairy? Was that all in the 60s? I don't know when. I was pretty much in high school, and I don't know how many years it was. Daddy had a great beef dairy and sold milk first to Mildon and then to Kraft that made cheese, but we'd have. Non pipeline. Yeah, maybe 10 or 12 that we'd milk. And they were on a concrete floor, but you put the milkers on individually and dump them. I'd help with that some. But it, it was often me to go out on the horse and gather up those cows to bring them in to milk. Oh, what else did we have to do? Mow the yard. The chickens, did you have to help slaughter them? Mama had this <laughs> system. Uh, <laughs> She, Reluctantly. <laughs> she did the chopping off the heads, but then I often did the plunging them in hot water to loosen the feathers and pluck them. And she would also be the one that um, actually butchered them and get all the insides out. But Not her favorite. Um, <laughs> I plucked chickens, fed chickens, plucked chickens, gathered eggs, and helped, like she said, get things ready to freeze or can. Was your mother a member of a home demonstration club? No, she was not. But uh, she did all those things. Most of our clothes growing up uh, were homemade. Uh, well, yours were. Well, now we'll get to yours. The girls. Yes, it was a lot for us. But uh, and then it I was very jeans. unusual to have. We might get one store bought dress a year. But this Uncle Frank that he was talking about, uh, he and his wife, because of the experience with travelers, they were living in Dallas by then and, and doing pretty well. And she would shop at Neiman Marcus. And once a year for Christmas, we would get a really Sweet. fancy dress from Uncle Frank and Aunt Ellen. I, now, I don't remember dr any dresses. Oh, you didn't get dresses? No, I, I didn't. <laughs> but we always had some very nice gift. Well, yeah, yeah later on. Maybe yeah. dresses came and you never got your <laughs> Later on, I, I, no, uh, I they remember were, I was probably school, too really young to remember. Purse, I guess. Uh, it was always an interesting thing from them. But our other side of the family, my mother's mother, <laughs> in essence, was a nanny for the Mayos that had Mayo Hotel in Tulsa, so... Jace, Jace had me down to work. <laughs> nice. <Good. laughs> yeah. Peter, Peter and Danny Mayo were quite a bit older than me, so I was always well stocked with good clothes. Much better than we would have had ordinarily. <laughs> but anyways, because Mama did sew and have a garden and uh, all that kind of thing, you know, taught me to sew. And, uh, we were probably a lot more you know, well taken care of than we would have been if it had just depended on what the cash could provide. Yeah. I mean, because of her doing so much of the labor herself. She was an avid gardener. Yeah, uh, very. The, um, uh, at the risk of this being taped, i <laughs> express an opinion here. Um, <laughs> home demonstration clubs, and I'm, I'm very, very pro extension. Uh, been extremely involved in extension my whole career. So I don't mean to belittle that in any way, but. Uh, I'll say it. She didn't need home demonstration. Well, no, it wasn't so much that. She wasn't competitive. Um, uh, 
I don't remember uh, her, ever taking anything to the fair. No, her her era of home demonstration participants uh, uh, were actually the teachers, and um, uh, but their motivation to be involved was competitiveness, and she just wasn't competitive. Uh, the uh, you know then the next generation or the younger portion of that generation, uh, you know there was still. Uh, there was a lot of um, a lot of training that took pay place, but a lot of it was actually not so much from extension as from the group itself. But uh, she just she just wasn't competitive and wasn't a participant in it. But but absolutely loved garden. I hated it, but she or at least she felt it necessary. No, uh-huh. she truly loved the garden. She really did. We. Uh, uh, I can remember back in an eight bottom plow and to plow her garden for her. Uh, you know, the plow and the tractor was, yeah, she had a big garden, <laughs> but it, it uh, took up as much garden space to turn around and take another swath as it did to get into it. But anyway, but she truly did love the garden. I she did a lot of, of extra stuff. I mean, you know, we'd have green beans for the whole year that we canned. And, by having 50 chickens, we'd have a chicken for every week, and then we'd save some back as laying hens for the next year. And we'd make sure to be there every year, yeah. usually. But she would do things like pickled beets. Or we had a, a little uh, peach tree that had small, white, clean peaches that were hard to manage any other way, but she'd make pickled peaches that were wonderful. And, and lots of pickles, yeah. cucumber pickles. Every and she'd try anything. Yeah. I remember one year Lots she decided crowd, to try well, not a lot. She didn't make a lot of kraut well, because so. it turned out that the cabbage grown here was hot enough that the kraut really wasn't that good. You needed sweeter cabbage to start with, so that it's didn't become cabbage. a big didn't become a big deal. But she would try anything. Yeah. You have a cellar or do yes? Yeah, oh yes, so that's where we all the canned goods yeah. went and where we went in the storm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I had a cousin that was living in Tulsa that was my age. Within a few months, and we were. Terror. They were competitive. <laughs> we were terrors. We weren't competitive. We were. All, the only reason we were competitive was trying to Seems think of a new idea that both of, both of us could try. Anyway, uh, big old. Uh, wow. Vent, pipe. Yeah. Tile vent pipe in, in the cellar, uh, the ventilation for it. Uh, we always uh, enjoyed our firecrackers Fourth of July. Well, one year we we, uh, we got to experiment with dropping uh, those uh, firecrackers down that pipe uh, because the break? cellar would make a wonderful booming noise when one went off. And <laughs> anyway, so we got to experiment, and you know they didn't sound there as good when they hit the floor, so we let them burn down to where they're about that long, and drop them in there so that it would explode in the air, you know, and that was the well, what we didn't realize is we were blowing up pickles left and right on the shelf, right behind that vent pipe. And uh, he went home, and I cleaned up pickles and glass for a long time. Anyway, uh, my chore and was I, uh, I was baby calf feeder, and and uh, and uh, beef feed bucket toter. And, and uh, and then went to the field at a pretty early age. Judy did too. Yeah, yeah. Were Judy you about was, twelve when you started plowing and stuff? Judy was an excellent plow hand. In fact, well, it all depends on on your parameters. You see, I tried to make everything come out nice and neat at the end and get just as far out as you could. No telling how many fence posts I took out because <laughs> I went too far before I quit. That that had a young hard hand one summer and and. Uh, he was too lazy to clean out his own plow when it balled up. It made you to clean out the plow for him. So. That's not quite the way it worked. <laughs> I uh, saw you cleaning out Freddie's plow several times. Well, I helped. <laughs> anyway. I, I really did enjoy doing anything with Daddy. And um, the year I finished high school, Daddy happened to be between hands. And I just asked him, you know, whether he thought I'd be up to the task for working for him that summer instead of him hiring a high school kid. And, so one summer I was his hand and, and didn't do all those things with Mama in the house and the garden. Mm. And all that kind of thing. <laughs> Did he actually pay you? 
Well, it, it went towards college. I, I don't remember money changing hands, but, <laughs> but um, I did plow. He never trusted me to do very much cultivating. I did a little bit of cultivating corn, but he definitely wouldn't turn me loose with sprayer. He didn't didn't want me exposed to that. And Jay eats, drinks, and breathes fumes <laughs> from all the chemicals in the world. <laughs> Um, I actually started drove, on the cultivator. Drove wheat truck. Helped him some uh, bucking hay. Usually I was driving the truck. But I never will forget one time pushing the hay off the him to barn. And he didn't neglect to tell me he'd bailed up a copperhead. Ooh. The first I found it was my hand right down the side of it. Oh, oh, we got to talk about hauling hay. <laughs> I didn't have a driver hauling hay one summer, and uh, uh, well, let me back up. Uh, Carol Sue was a preemie, uh, too much oxygen, got her retinas. And uh, so, and then what, mumps or measles in three finished, finished off your vision? Anyway, so, uh, uh, but I was short a truck driver, so, uh, large truck with a, with the bail loader. And uh, so I tied binder twine on her left and right elbows, ran it out the truck window, and up, tied it up up on the loader, and uh, just drove her like a horse. Pull on the left binder twine, and she'd veer off left, pull on her right elbow, and she'd veer off to the right, pull on both of them when we were loaded. I was driving. Yeah. <laughs> so, and it all worked famously until. Uh, uh, she's awful good with math, but she forgot one bale and forgot where she left it. She was dragging off the truck, and I was barn. She forgot where she left one bale, and and the truck was pitched up, and it was a good five or six feet off the ground. She tripped off that one bale and rolled off the back of the truck and hit the ground. And lost another driver. But, <laughs> I went. I went. I dived off the bale. I it kind of started tipping, and I, I went off, head first. It could have been pretty terrible. Yeah. Well, where were you when you were doing guiding the? I was stuck in the truck, catching the oh. catching the hay coming up the loader. Coming, I was on yeah. the back of the truck. And see, I was long gone by then. So. Yeah. And did your father know you were doing that? Well, I'm sure. Uh, I think we told him after it's over. <laughs> <laughs> Jay was always inventing about figuring out how to get something done. I let you tell the story once I started. Daddy had this little simplicity garden oh. tractor, and Jay decided to modify it for his personal use. I built the first three-wheel all-terrain vehicle known to man. You've got to describe what this thing looked like to start with. Walk behind garden tractor, little small engine, little tractor tires and handlebars, you know, and it would have a cultivator attachment or a mower attachment. It had seen its last day, and so uh, I, Dad gave it to me, and I brought it in here, and I took the handlebars off and reversed the axle, reversed the motor, took my 26-inch bicycle, took the back wheel off of it, attached it where the handlebars went, and uh, built a three-wheeler on it. So, anyway. Worked awful good until uh, I decided I needed to go faster and faster, and I took the governor off of it. I've been I've been two miles south of here on it at a neighbor's house, and was coming home and went across the uh, highway. Uh, I had, uh, like I said, had removed the governor and uh, uh, got to run a little bit fast with my bale and wire throttle and. and uh, uh, blew a rod out of it and it embedded in the back of my right calf when I came across the highway. So I, uh, I had a I had a chunk of steel in the leg about that long, a uh, piece of rod, but uh, uh, but I pushed it home uh, and uh, hit it uh, and dug the steel out and and uh, never did tell anybody because I didn't want Dad to know I'd blown up that motor. So, Anyway, toughness kind of runs there. He's telling Jay lately about something that he didn't even know about. But I can remember one time being in the house and Daddy coming in because he 
been cutting wood with an axe and had hit the end of his boot and gone through enough that it had gone through the nail, but he didn't want Mama to know. We had a lot of things for one another. <laughs> Mama to know that he'd done this. Mama was he's pretty apt to worry. He came in. And said, Shh, don't tell Mama. He didn't even know how bad it was. So he comes in, and takes off his shoes to see what's going on. But he never let on. I doubt he ever told Mama what he done. I see. I haven't heard some of these stories because I, I was away at school so much of the time. I missed. Well, when her dad was a young adult, he got kicked by a draft horse, and uh, it was his right leg. If I remember right. Uh, broke the knee and uh, he was extremely bow legged on him. No, it was his left leg. Don't ask me, I don't know. It was his left leg. Um, anyway, broke the broke the bone, uh, terribly bow legged. And then um, and then uh, much later in life, Derek out kicked him in the same leg, broke it again, and uh, so that leg was bent the other direction pretty bad but uh, <laughs> one day he dropped a spike hair on his foot and uh, it went it missed every bone in his foot but it went between his big toe and the second toe went, went right through the meat of his foot uh, and out through the bottom of his boot and uh, and he was pinned to the ground in the field so he just jerked the hair out came home I didn't know about that one. cleaned it up and and that big toe it it raked the tendon and pulled that toe back and so for years his big toe was pulled back terribly bad until early 80s and he was unloading the bale spear out of his pickup and it got away from him probably because his left knee was so weak and uh, he stumbled and this 200 pound device landed on that same toe and straightened it right back out. <laughs> so, anyway. uh, his, I don't know how many times, uh, uh, our dad was an, absolutely an eternal optimist. He uh, uh, never had a bad day. Doctor himself, I think. <laughs> we it wasn't like we were anti ministry or anything. I mean, no. you know, anything that you know you really needed doctor's attention, be there. And I remember, you know, we were the first ones in line when the polio vaccine came out. And it's it's not that didn't believe in medicine. Mm -hmm. It was just that if it wasn't convenient, you just kept going. <laughs> you didn't worry about tetanus shots. No, yeah, we had tetanus shots. <laughs> Yeah. Sound like Teddy of, needed an extra view. <laughs> <laughs> we had one every year. What I was trying to say a minute ago is his, one of his favorite expressions is uh, uh, if you're farming, you've had a good day, you get home with 10 fingers. Um, a lot of farming accidents. Mm -hmm. Well, Jay's had some close friends that had some bad ones. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's close to home. Well, when, when you were working for him that summer, how early would he have you up and out? Oh, I have no idea. He was the real early riser. Yeah, that's my mother. Three. <laughs> Crazy. You know, she'd be sleeping good. And, and he'd, just, I, he'd just wake up spontaneously. He might set an alarm, and he might hear the little click before it actually went off. But most of the time, he was long gone before it was time for it to go off. But in the summertime, he, he would work way before dawn and, and she swore he'd come right under her window to do it <laughs> but, you know we had our windows open because we didn't have air conditioners in bedrooms and so <laughs> bang, bang, bang. You know, I, I don't remember getting up extraordinarily yeah. early and, and oftentimes you know, we'd be working after dark i can remember more than once mama taking supper to the field in the dark mama used to help with the weed hauling too and when we were little <laughs> Sometimes she would um, set us up with a quilt or, so, you know, blanket out at the edge somewhere where we could play while she uh, loaded up. Or maybe she'd go for blackberries in between rounds or something. There's a place you know. up across the creek and so, around that had 
really good blackberry patch, and there was one little stand up there. I think it had a lot of persimmon trees. But anyway, that was a favorite place. I, that's still one of my most <laughs> fond memories is going up there with the quilt. Oh, yeah. Must be Sometimes we'd have a, a picnic for lunch. I remember a time or two. And then we'd sometimes get to ride in the... This is back when nobody worried, you know, we didn't have seat belts yet. Nobody worried about kids in the back of the truck. We'd ride in the weed all the way to the grain elevator. I lost my shoe one time. <laughs> we dumped. Uh -oh. One time, Mom had gone to town with a fairly old pickup that I'm not sure what she was hauling back. Do you remember what it was when she got stopped by the patrol? Oh, it was. It was uh two ton wheat truck coming home from well, I thought she was in that old gray Ford pickup. Nope. I didn't no. know she ever drove the big truck. Oh yeah. No, she always yeah. She was coming back from Afton and and uh, this wasn't the most delightful looking old truck, but uh, <coughs> but dad had gone to a lot of effort to get all the lights working right and everything was fine. Anyway, uh, she was coming back from the elevator and turned off the highway coming this direction. Patrolman had been following her from Tim Mile Corner up here two miles away and and uh, turned off and followed her down the section line and stopped her. Walked up and said, uh, you know, I've been following you for two miles because I just knew that whenever you turned off, you wouldn't be able to signal. So I just wanted to tell you how impressed I was all lights are working on your truck. Well, that's, that is not the story I was oh. thinking about. I didn't know about that. No, this one, she was coming back to, from Vanita, oh. and I'm sure it was in that old gray Ford pickup. And I think she must have had it loaded with seed or fertilizer or something. Anyway, it was way overloaded for the springs on it. And so it was kind of swaying. And she got stopped because mm -hmm. it wasn't behaving according to the coil. <laughs> I take it she didn't have a job off the farm either. Then. Short period of time she yeah, did. And she really enjoyed that. I mean, she was a dedicated farm wife, but she really enjoyed working in an office. Um, she had started out in college in Edmond, and uh, the war came along, and she came up here, lived in Vanita, commuted down to prior to the munitions plant to work in an office down there. And she really, really enjoyed doing that kind of thing. And when I was in high school, for a period of time, she worked at what was then the Munsingware plants, the same building that now has, is it Cinch or somebody different Cinch, now? Cinch, yeah. But she was the they secretary made, to the... They made hosiery back then, and now they make uh, Boeing wiring harnesses, but same building. She very much enjoyed that, and um, really at the point that she was retirement age, she worked part-time church secretary at her church. And, was really, really sad to have to give that up after she had a stroke. <laughs> mm -hmm. She loved that kind of thing. But... You're talking about going to the field early. Uh, 45 acre field. And it, Dad never did tell me, but I finally figured it out just a few years ago, or at least I think I did. He must have <laughs> He must have lost a stand because his field dried out on him. Uh, but you know, he he was certainly a morning person and be gone quick. But uh, you know, we weren't expected to be functional till seven or eight. But uh, but this one field from man, from the time I was nine till till uh, till I got out of college and he quit dirt farming and I started. Uh, we would be in that field at two o'clock every year, and uh, so that it was done in the same day. And I, and I always went. It was the only one. He would get me up, and off we would go. But uh, uh, but I finally figured out that it, he must have lost a stand in that field one time. It wasn't going to happen again. So we would start at two. So by dark uh, that same day, it'd be it would be worked and planted. But uh, of course now. That'd be a two-hour job. But it used to, it used to take a while. I don't know what made me think of it about this, but um, I passed where we talked about where the blackberries were. The thing about this property that fascinated me, going on up through the pasture there, <clears throat> there was one particularly big buffalo wall, and there were some other smaller ones up there. That just that kind of history with what the land had been always interested me. 
and I can remember, I, I lived in Alaska 20 years and came back in 2000. And it was after I came back that Daddy and I took a drive up the section line here in a mile east, and he started showing me where in the old days the wagons had come across from south, headed up, I don't know where they were going up, eventually maybe to Kansas City, I don't know. But a major thoroughfare up through there, and you could still see where, he'd have to show me, but he, I could still see where the terrain was different because of where it had been worn out by the, all those wagons going through year after year after year. And there was a period of time when there was kind of a thoroughfare from Ketchum to, I don't know where going this way, that mm -hmm. people would come by right by this spring and, and between here and where that house sits, right on north. The, she mentioned the cedar trees, uh, um, uh, George, great, great, grandfather planted four cedar trees because there wasn't a tree on this place and wasn't a tree from here to Bonita. Uh, and my dad could remember when there were no trees other than those cedar trees from here to Bonita. He, uh, uh, of all the, well, of course he, he did see the bulk of the history of this place since it had been inhabited, but, uh, but, uh, he's the one that, He's the one that saw everything from farming with horses to farming with GPS. Uh, I remember 1976, he bought his first tractor with a cab, air conditioning. And, and uh, he, said, he said, boy, don't let anybody kid you about the good old days. So there wasn't anything good at all about farming with horse all day long. He said, I like this cab. <laughs> Go ahead. Didn't you find uh, quite a few arrowheads when oh, we were little? Yeah. yeah. So they're still interesting artifacts that were in. Going kind of back to the good old days, <clears throat> I can remember um, our folks were really good about pointing out something that might have real significance. And this one thing was making a point of getting us up there to actually watch the threshing machine work on the next section over because they were almost extinct and everything was going to combines at that point and um, that's something that stuck in my mind that I wouldn't have had any knowledge of if they hadn't made a point to say you know you need to see what this is doing and I think back to when I was really young um, my mother set me down in front of the TV to watch Queen Elizabeth's coronation because this is a significant thing in history I vaguely remember that. I just very, very vaguely because I was still pretty little. Our mother was big deal. She was very history oriented, very politically oriented. Uh, uh, had a good sense of current events that were going to be significant. And, uh, gavel to gavel conventions. Yeah, yeah when it mattered. <laughs> Yeah, back when. Yeah, the, when you didn't know who was going <laughs> to be the nominee <laughs> until that last <laughs> vote. So we developed our interest in politics from that experience. We were we were raised staunch Republicans in our democratic world up here. My mother was always, our uh, precinct was down at the old school that I went to for five years. They never had that experience, but anyway, she was always the Republican observer or whatever you Judge. Thank you. <laughs> and he's the more political. Was registrar she's several uh, how many years did she do that? I don't know. She worked in the 1960 decennial census. So she, that was more out of civic responsibility than monetary need, I think. Well, around the dinner table, would politics be the discussion or would it be something else? Mm. Well, that no, no, we'd get called in later for that. Uh, <laughs> uh, Judy's nine years older than I am, and uh, she was an avid campfire girl. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, I got drugged all over this place, eating burnt bread and <laughs> crud. Now, uh, Jake, that was fun. Not to him. <laughs> I we, we turned him off of camping forevermore. <laughs> I enjoyed it. These, uh, uh, this cousin I was talking about before, uh, his uh, his dad was 
mom's brother just younger than her. And, uh, you know, we did a lot of things we should have patented. Uh, <laughs> ATVs. We had a zip line when we were yeah. kids. How tall was that ladder we used to get up to that limb? Mm, it's probably 25 feet. Oh, was it that high? Talk yeah. about Are something you sure? fun. Man. Yeah, I, I remember the ladder. Two, two befores <laughs> with one before runs oh, across it. Yeah, leaned up against this big old limb. I mean, solid limb out there. That was one end, and the other end of the line was across the creek, and I guess tied to another tree. Mm -hmm. Big old limb. You know, just the old homemade porch swing thing. Climb up on the limb, get your feet in there, and off you go. But I'm glad I got just a little too attached to the tree one pass. <laughs> Took a rip right out of these pants, but I was thinking about it. Pants on one side of the creek and ended up on the other. <laughs> our, our two, Dad was an only child, so our two uncles were absolute wild bears. They were. They survived World War II in the Navy. <laughs> they were both Navy guys and just nuts. Uh, so much fun. The uh, Ed, the oldest one, uh, came home to drive an ambulance when driving an ambulance mattered, you know. But, uh, it was all about speed, which suited him just fine. And, and, he was also a pilot, and he has landed a plane in this field across the road. Yeah. He's landed everywhere on this plane. <laughs> well, I, I saw that when, it, when I was in college, he took me from. I don't even know where he picked me up, and we went to Wichita for some reason. He took me back to Muskogee at least once, if not more. He, uh, Just because he could. He brought his plane in. We, we've got a piece of, of native meta uh, that is long, and uh, it's hay meta, and uh, he, uh, his favorite place to land was in this 100 acre field right across the road, but it was in soybeans at the time, so he went over and landed in the meadow. Well, this is right before the meadow was was uh, cut for hay and, and nearly flipped his plane when he landed in there, and, and uh, then he couldn't get out. He had, to, he had to go back and forth five or six times and smash down an old dad's hay so he could get the plane back out. Dad, Dad didn't mind that kind of stuff. It was, I remember Mom talking about being, he was an avid hunter. Um, both of them. Yeah, all three of them. Well, yeah. But uh, uh, Mom used to talk about somebody come along and want to go quail hunt, Dad just leave tractor and field and leave, you know. And, uh, what she call you? We could always like count on having quail in the fall. I remember going hunting with him one time and I was okay with a 22, but he wanted to see if I wanted to try and get some birds with a shotgun. And I shot once or twice, and then I gave it back to him and said, I'd rather have the quail. <laughs> <laughs> She's uh, more than okay with the 22. The only person I ever knew that could shoot a frog uh, without it jumping in the water. Oh, boy, a frog faces the water, you shoot it, it hops back in, but she figured out where to hit him right behind the head to where it just dropped. <laughs> he was our frog leg provider. Modern day frog digging. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you mentioned you went to a, a, a school that they didn't get to. One room school. Uh, Daddy went to success. Actually, found a picture. Of Dad. You got a picture? I've got a picture of Dad at success. In this little, uh, yeah, yeah. The little the, building uh, had the success marching band. They all apparently had had oak can drums there. It looks like <laughs> it had oh, been in oatmeal boxes. Yeah, a separate, <laughs> uh, different location, about a half a mile away originally. Did Daddy go to where we knew it? Where I went to school? Was it there when yeah. he went? Yeah. And. I went through the fifth grade there, and then our enrollment dropped enough that we were consolidated with the new gun. I think we had to have 15 that last year, and we had 13. So I went sixth grade through high school in the new gun. And how, how far from here to? Uh, two and a half miles more. How would he get there, your father, when he was born? Oh, horseback. 
Mm -hmm. How would you? They usually took me. Um, I wasn't quite old enough that they wanted to turn me loose with the horse across the highway. And one of our neighbors did ride her horse quite a bit. Not only farming, but Dad saw a lot of change in this country. Grand Lake is just four miles east of here. Um, uh, when he was growing up, the the uh, the water resort was Spavanaugh Creek, and and we never went to the lake other than some occasion when somebody else would have an event there would go to Spavanaugh because that's where he went. And but anyhow. Uh, he went to high school in Cleora, um, uh, which is in the middle of the lake. Uh, Cleora now has moved a mile from where it was originally. But, but anyway, uh, uh, but he went. To, he graduated from. In fact, there's this graduation picture from from Cleora in '34. But. Uh, uh, one of the most interesting stories is him telling about the uh, sailboat bridge being built. Um, the, uh, there wasn't any water anywhere around. They were just building this monstrous tall bridge out in the middle of the prairie. And uh, uh, he said the workers were jumping back and forth across the creek and as they were building the thing, you know. And uh, I don't know how tall it is, but it literally it's, is built oh, to yeah. take a sailboat under. And it's just sitting out in the middle of the prairie over there, and, and uh, uh, they built it while they were building the dam because Grove was going to be cut off. And uh, uh, he said, you know, it's four or five years before the lake filled up, and there's any water underneath this bridge after they built it out there, sitting in the middle of nowhere. But, uh, saw a lot of change in this country. And in farmers, both the land and the yeah. So you would have gone to Benita for high school, yeah. and no, Carol would have gone. I, I went to the Oklahoma School for the Blind in Muskogee. Started when I was five. Lived in dorm. Came home for weekends. And I went to Muskogee every Sunday too. Yes, to take me back to school. <laughs> they, they were they were very dedicated. Yeah. Uh, the uh, the Arkansas River was out one time. Dad decided Carol soon needed to go home, so he took the grain truck down there because it crossed the river to get her back. So education was important to both, yeah. both parents. I yeah. couldn't wait to start school because somehow I got to visit Success one day with you for part of a day, and I couldn't wait till I could go to school. And I actually ended up starting a year early because they decided that school administration decided I was ready to go ahead and go. So we had to kind of hustle getting things ready. Mom and got some hours at OCU, I guess. Is that right? No. UCO. Yeah. yeah. UCO. <laughs> Central State. At that time. Central State College, yeah. I guess, at that um, time. And, um, and Dad uh, went to John Brown momentarily. Oh, I didn't even know that. Uh, I thought he, cause I didn't realize that he'd actually attended. I thought I think he was he got just planning. A semester on, in down I there. did not know that. I didn't either. Yeah. Oh. And then war kind of changed everything. Um, well, he was deferred because he was a farmer. Mm hmm. Yeah. He, he, um, he tried to enlist, but they, they wouldn't, had, had, to, had to farm. Anyway, so Judy's got some OSU hours and some OU hours, and, <laughs> and Carol Sue's got a BS from OBU and an MS and a uh, doctor. Wrong, from, but they don't care about all the details of that. Okay, you. Okay, you. Ostater, Aggie Yeah, I only changed because at that time. Uh, I changed my major and OSU didn't have a nursing program yet at that point. And the next year after I'd gone to OU, I came back to OU, OSU, 
game sitting on visitor's side, and I was doing pretty good being polite until OSU made one particularly good <laughs> play. <laughs> We, uh, and we're all avid OSU fans now because Jay's son played there. So <laughs> we, we had a cousin that played in the '60s uh, at OU. OSU. Oh, no, well, OSU, uh, and then oh, yeah. and no, then we had a cousin another played at, right? at OU in cousin, the '50s, yeah. and another cousin played at OSU in the '60s, and then my son uh, graduated two years ago. Anyway, so my family did reasonably well. Uh, Noah has two bachelors from OSU. I've got a bachelor's from OSU. My wife has a bachelor's from OSU. My daughter has a bachelor's and a master's from OSU. And then my other daughter has a degree from OU. So, anyway. That's a pretty good track record. Yeah, yeah. We still learn. <laughs> Yeah, because she's got the grandsons. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, how were, how were some holidays like back? Oh, <coughs> holidays. In the day. So we've been talking about Uncle Ed and the cousin that he corralled with. Well, there's an older brother that is Tommy closer to your age. Yes, just a year ahead of me in school. Uh, yeah, and so a couple of years younger than me. But we and uh, our grandmother were were the holidays. Christmas was in Tulsa. Everything else was here on the farm. Mm -hmm. We had uh, fireworks every 4th of July. Always got to have fresh tomatoes and corn on the cob. cob out of the, usually watermelon. Maybe oh, yeah, not on grown, but yeah. homemade ice cream. <laughs> yeah. um, Thanksgiving, until everybody got too decrepit, was going out to hunting early in the day. Mm -hmm. Big Thanksgiving dinner here. And then go to at the farm as Aunt Bertie's yep. referred to. Get that, that's all literal. piled in the truck. <laughs> well, pick up. And I sat on the tailgate one time and went over a terrace and my feet caught. And I'm, here I am standing on the terrace. <laughs> pick up goes right on by. But anyway, we went, we would go we around and see the whole farm for Aunt Bernice's sake. And, and over there, that place where I fell out of the truck was the pear orchard that. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, how old who, is that? Who planted the pears? Francis. Which would be approximately how long ago now? Uh, roughly turn of the century. Uh, and there's still he, some he of those trees. That, I mean, there trees, may not be. Now, trees. see, we should have planned for that. There might still be some pears on those trees. Uh, they frosted out. Oh, they? Some of these <laughs> trees would would be all hollowed out and just sort of a little hole on one side and they'd still put on some pears. Those are kind of gnarly, like but <laughs> wonderful. Like good. Mm -hmm. Mama would make pear honey. And pear preserves. Yeah. Um, can some too, I think, sometimes. Yeah. What was your favorite dish that she made? Oh. If you had one. Oh, okay. Goodness. Couldn't possibly have one oh. favorite. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, what is it? What is it? Oyster casserole. Oh. No, 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 no. <laughs> That was good, but not day. that much. I was always impressed when she made cinnamon rolls. Ooh. That, that was rare, but very, very special. Once I went to the new <laughs> schools, uh, early on, I was catching the bus up the highway. Later on, it came by here, but I had that half mile plus, most of the time, walked it. And walking back home, I could get nearly to the creek sometimes and begin to smell fresh bread. And she would, when lots of times when she'd make bread, she'd make cinnamon rolls. That was just wonderful to come home to warm bread. She made more of that when we had our own milk. And I don't know why, because you don't necessarily put a lot of milk in bread, though. No, but hardly any. I don't know why she, it seemed like it was during that time that Must she did it. Must have been contemporaneous and not necessarily. I guess so. that was to a do. consequence of. <laughs> but um, mm. talking about how. Um, you look at things and do things. When we did have our own milk, she was concerned about the fact that she didn't want to be drinking raw milk. So she got this great big pasteurizer. What did that thing hold? Three gallons? Oh, no, it's good size. But it, it, it had was, a timer on it. Yeah, didn't it? and its own heat plate thing yeah. that was mm -hmm. keep at the right temperature so that she could pasteurize the milk. And when we had our own milk, we churned butter. 
cottage cheese. She, she did that had, on occasion, but yeah, it, it, it turned out not good very either, good. So that didn't last either. <laughs> she couldn't interest in that, us in that very much. It had a different hot it flavor. Didn't it didn't taste know. right. No. And the texture wasn't good. No. I mean, it was just. <laughs> no. I just forgot my actual absolute all time favorite dish. Oh, no. What? Peanut butter sandwiches. Oh, oh Jay. <laughs> We don't we have, have a different opinion she, here. How she made peanut butter sandwiches, do we? I never knew that a peanut butter sandwich involved jelly until I saw it on television one time. <laughs> um, I, I, and I guess this was a depression and holdover deal. It had to be. They really won't believe it. Uh, but it's good. Go no, on, it isn't. My on. tongue curls easily <laughs> before you speak the words. Peanut butter, miracle whip, and lettuce. And it is wonderful. <laughs> Wonderful. Miracle Whip, not mayonnaise. Not mayonnaise. Oh, no. Whip. We hardly ever use mayonnaise. No, Mom was, she was anti mayonnaise. Anti mayonnaise, yeah. She's afraid yeah, of my spoil, I guess. When I got married, I thought I had arrived when I got mayonnaise. Oh, I still but don't I, like mayonnaise. I like Miracle Whip. I, I, do. Do. I still use it. Yeah. But it, peanut it isn't. Butter, lettuce and, and because, you know, whip. the yeah. peanut butter went down a lot easier. You didn't stick to your mouth. <laughs> Really good. <laughs> she need I don't fix ours that way anymore. Definitely, definitely do. <coughs> <coughs> you mentioned terraces. I love all you did. So he was involved with soil conservation back in the day. Oh, yeah, yeah. That was uh, school board of success. Then school board at Veneta High School. Um, he wasn't. Uh, he wasn't on the conservation district board, but uh, he was on the ASCS board and the, F and the FHA board and FMHA board uh, before they were all consolidated. Uh, uh, actually, conservation district is my deal. I'm. Uh, I just got my 15-year pen because I put in 14 years that ended 14 years ago and then went back on the board last year. So anyway, uh, so for 29 years, all the time I was off the board, I was an associate. But uh, yeah, we, conservation district's been a pretty important deal. And be ponds on the property. Five. When did you start no-till, Jay? 1984. Pioneered in this area. Didn't you? Yeah, I've got the oldest continuous no-till field in Oklahoma. Extension comes up and plays with it on occasion. Because he was not going to get up at 2 o'clock to farm that, <laughs> to do that farm to conserve moisture uh, field, I mean. Yeah. <laughs> And then I built a lot of ponds. Uh, I did a lot of custom dozer work for 15 years, probably. Yeah, at least 15. The, the no-till question is probably worth talking about a little bit more because of the time that went through and how so many people were failing and uh, differential that, that that made in your whole approach to the farm? Uh, okay. Well, uh, I mean, you were talking history. Well, it was yeah. significant. Okay, I got out of school in 78. Uh, had enough clip hours so that I could skip a semester, so I stayed home in the fall of 77 and then actually put my, my first... Uh, crops out in 77. Uh, I was farming in earnest in 78. Dad was 39 years older than me. He wanted to quit crop farming and continue to run cattle. Uh, so we we were never actually in business together at all. Uh, I rented his cropland and, and other cropland. Uh, and uh, by 1980, 
uh, <laughs> was farming on uh, way too much ground and um, um, didn't have any equity, didn't have, didn't have a partner. But, uh, but, but that was a curious time. Inflation was so rampant then that uh, uh, make fun of bankers since I am one now. Uh, bankers uh, didn't worry about equity because you'd have some tomorrow because inflation was so rampant. And uh, so I had a tremendous amount of money borrowed and was way overextended and didn't know it because I was a young college graduate and too smart to know that I was in trouble. And uh, then the 80s, uh, extremely high in interest rates, uh, drought, everything else. And, and by the uh, by the early mid 80s, I was, I was in trouble. My machinery was wearing out, I needed to replace it, really couldn't afford it. And, uh, and um, even though I was a conservation advocate, uh, that was not the driving force, it was economics. And uh, uh, going back to picking on extension again, uh, Oklahoma State was one of the absolute pioneers in no-till in the nation. And um, they had some guys that were, were real advocates and, um, and they got the cart before the horse. There was no equipment, there was no herbicide, uh, and the concept failed and, um, and uh, no-till uh, in Oklahoma was just absolutely a dirty word because a lot of people had tried and just Technology just wasn't there. Well, technology was starting to, the rest of the country was starting to catch up by the early mid 80s and and, uh, and the tools and and uh, herbicide. Uh, Roundup was introduced. Roundup was ridiculously expensive, but it worked. And uh, uh, so I really was down uh, on the pens and, and um, uh, if I was going to continue to farm, I was going to have to do it with much, much less capital. And um, uh, the uh, anyway, told Dad what I was considering, and uh, and this this field I was talking about that we would get up and work in the middle of the night. Uh, it it was so tired and sandy, and uh, he was thinking about putting it in Bermuda. And he said, well, give that place a try and see what happens. And and, uh, and that is the oldest no-till field in Oklahoma. But anyway, he was, uh, uh, he was very supportive of the whole process. And, and uh, anyway, I just made lock, stock, and barrel conversion, sold a large four-wheel drive tractor, or crated it in on a, on a, uh, no-till drill and off we went. So anyway, uh, but it was, it was uh, like I say, for me, it was an economic driver. Um, uh, and, uh, and a lot of the people tried it around the neighborhood and they, they thought maybe I knew what I was doing. They soon figured out I didn't and they quit and went back to some kind of conventional system, but, uh, but it's worked well. The, you know, the secret to it is you've just got to suffer through a few years until the soul kind of responds to the process and then it works. But uh, anyway, uh, but uh, but I don't want to leave the impression that it was some magnanimous tree hugging uh, <laughs> motivation. We're not tree I was huggers. broke. And that was the only way I was going to survive, and uh, it saved me. Up. <clears throat> And I like it, and uh, and uh, then you know, it freed up a lot of time that normally you'd be in the field, and so I started doing a lot of custom dozing, uh, which was a good thing because it would keep me busy when I'd be tempted to go work ground. So. Moving dirt one way or the other. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> the, uh, you know, you, uh, in your notes, there's something in there about uh, the uh, smell of dirt, and there is something to that. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, but I'll, I will tell you in this country that uh, that hogging out uh, 
topsoil that hadn't been disturbed with the dozer smells a lot better than old tired farmland does. Mm -hmm. yeah. It smells pretty good. I love the smell of the garden dirt in the spring. And the taste of the first radishes. <laughs> dirt. <laughs> I mean, they were washed, but they still kind of, you could, they smell more like dirt than the ones you get in, oh, yeah. in the grocery store. And the grocery store is no flavor to anything. Well, since the two of you don't live on a farm, is there something in particular you miss most? Mm -hmm. I miss roaming the property. When I think back to what my parents let me do, I really can't believe they did. I'd be gone for hours out in these woods. They wouldn't have had a clue where in the world I was. And I guess that wanderlust started early. <laughs> back before this house was born, so that has to mean I couldn't have been more than four years old. I climbed a chicken wire fence, and my mother saw me disappearing across the creek going up into the woods. <laughs> How old were you? I couldn't have been more than four because we were still living in that little house. Be being here and then farther away, I had more of an opportunity to debrief uh, our parents uh, uh, late in their lives. And, uh, hmm. and in their defense, uh, she was a wild child. They yes, could I, not find her. They, yeah, I mean, I they, yeah. they did their best. She ran away in stores before she, kids did that sort of yeah. thing. But uh, she I just that. she just roamed like a dog. But she had to wait home. Smart. One kid. time, I tell you what, things got interesting. Sometimes I was on the horse one time up in there, nearly to the next. I'd been nearly half mile up in there because it was nearly to the field on the other side that you get to the other side of the road. And started back down fairly close to the creek, but I couldn't see the creek. Started into this kind of thicket of trees. I don't think any of them were any more around than two or three inches. But the further I got in there, the denser it got. And it finally got to the point that there wasn't room for me and the horse, and there wasn't room to turn the horse around. So I had to get off the horse, lead the horses through till we could get out something clearer again. So it was kind of wild up in there. Yeah, I still enjoy Right around there. When we lived in Alaska, I loved to backpack up in the mountains and through the woods. And just tromping this territory. But you're exactly right about different dispositions. I, I you know, everybody now thinks you know, you've got to be politically correct. You don't paddle your kids or whatever. But if my parents had not taken physical restraints to me. I, I, I don't know what they could have done other than lock me up in a room. But I hated having to be told to go out and get your own switch and bring it back in. <laughs> That's just too humiliating. But Jay was so much more sensitive and he has been able to raise his children in an entirely different way. You could reason with Jay and he had a sensitive heart but man not me I just buck it. The worst thing I ever did was try to run from daddy when he wanted to paddle me. That that didn't work. But didn't do that again. Let's see. You must have outgrown that really, really young because I don't remember that trait in you at all. Well, they, they used discipline as it was needed, and finally I... Quite a bit was needed. Yeah, <laughs> apparently. But I'm, you know, I, I didn't learn to internalize and control myself, but I could have been a totally different place, a different style of parenting. She's a bona fide redhead. Yep. <laughs> Did church play a, a, a role in doing okay. yeah. In our we're Southern Baptist church is what we grew up in. And at least way back then, they had what they called cradle roll. I, actually, a lot of kids, I guess, got enrolled in the cradle roll before they were actually born. But anyway, <laughs> from, from day one right on up, we were in church. Uh, this George, the great-great-grandfather, was... Uh, was a uh, charter member of the church that, I, that we grew up in, that I still attend. Uh, but then dad was uh, raised in a Christian church, uh, but uh, mom was Southern Baptist, so she drug him back to the church he belonged in. <laughs> well, he started going there before he met her. Is that right? Yeah, you remember the story about thinking she was someone that he knew and 
looking, seeing He's, her in the choir. First saw her in the choir and thought that she was Frances Frost. Oh, yeah. <laughs> And that's and curious, the, this woman. They're about the same age, and uh, and uh, I just can't Francis hear that story without laughing. Now, but they were, they always did look real similar. In the war up, up north of town, there was a glider field where they trained the glider pilots, and so there were a lot of those young men in the community. And this church made a, a real effort to um, reach out to young adults, and so. I think Daddy had started going there because something was happening there. You know, a lot of contemporaries, and that's where he met Mama. And I farmed that glider field mm -hmm. for ten years. Sometimes it rained there when it was dry as a bone here. I remember. Mm -hmm. How often did the two of you come back to the farm? Not as often as we once did. I'm, I'm now just so far away. <laughs> Although I've gotten back several times this year. But well, when I moved back to Oklahoma, I lived here um, on north of the house in a trailer for five years before we moved where we are now. Um, when I moved back, both our parents were in pretty frail health, and Daddy died during that period of time. And then I was moved about a year and a half before Mama died. Yeah, we don't come and stay as long as we did when Mama was still here. Yeah. Last time you drove around on the property? Oh, now that has been a while. You used to come back and visit and find time to crawl in something Jay was doing, tractor, combine, or something. So what's currently going on on the farm? Well, if I can get that combine out of here, we need to be cutting beans. Um, beans? Soybeans. Soybeans. <laughs> We, uh, I was delayed getting started and attempted to start Saturday. Um, I had a real good man that was helping me that I lost to a much better job. But uh, apparently he had never run, in, well, not apparently, he had never run that type of combine, which is an extremely quiet machine. And uh, when I, and I thought it was a very good field, I pulled it out uh, unhooked the corn head, put the soybean head on, and was pulling it back here to service it and go to the field, and uh, threw it in gear to blow the coons and dirt out of it before I serviced it. And, and as soon as I threw it in gear, I knew I had a you know, I had a uh, chaffer pitman bearing out, and, and uh, which is a terrible thing when those bearings go out and you don't know it. Uh, it it destroys the chaffer that I put back together last night and destroys the chaffer frame that's laying on the ground behind the combine. So anyway, uh, so drop the header off back the combine in and tore it down. Uh, anyway, uh, I'll have it back together tonight and uh, then we'll probably get started cutting beans finally. Well, how would you learn how to do all that, though, with the mechanical part, just on your own? Uh, Dad. Dad. Dad was a, he was a, <laughs> he was a, an excellent intuitive mechanic, uh, but far preferred to do it the hard way. Uh, <laughs> if, uh. It was intuitive. <laughs> If it took a dime part that was available in Veneta, it it built it, and uh, and uh, and as you can tell, I'm kind of bent that way too. But uh, uh, but he did it with a cutting torch and a, and a file, and and I. And if it didn't take that much for this, lots of bale wire. No, he he was pretty <laughs> rough mechanic, but uh, but very intuitive. Uh, I'm. Uh, I'm a little more into machine work than he was, uh, but anyway. Yeah, uh, he had a settling torch and a vice, and yeah, that's about it. Yeah. Anyway, uh, he did more most of the repairs himself instead of taking them off. Yeah, he he never took anything off, and I don't. That uh, was what the early morning work was. Yeah. In the sun. 
the, uh, the work that woke us up. <laughs> Caddy cork to get everything ready to go again. Yeah, we, <clears throat> I overhaul my own engines, transmissions. Uh, a machine arrives here and leaves when it's sold. It doesn't ever go to the shop. Do it here. I'm I'm a much better mechanic than I am an agronomist. Uh, I've probably survived because I'm a mechanic and a trader instead of a good farmer. And a good trader, which, as I understand, was the trade grandpa's. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm bred to be a, as I understand, my grandfather was not mechanical at all, uh, but he was an exceptional trader, and uh, uh, I, uh, I do take after my dad. He, I think I probably put more things back together. Uh, we, we take an equal amount of things apart, but I probably put more of them back together than he does. <laughs> Well, that would be interesting funny if I didn't about all the things that were in pieces when we cleaned out the house. Oh, <laughs> well, yeah, but that was yeah. <laughs> not so good toward the last. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I'm really am intrigued with mechanical and electronic things, and and uh, um, uh, I've got a uh, starter generator tester over there that I bought at an auction for fifteen dollars. It didn't work. It had uh, it had a few diodes blown out in it, and for some reason I'd left a stereo on the shelf that my wife and I had bought new, and, and uh, so I tore it apart and robbed the diodes out of it and, and fitted them in that machine to get it running. You know, I just, I just. That goes in place of your tractor. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I don't mind reading, I don't mind studying and I figure if somebody else was smart enough to build the first time I'm sure they figure out how to fix it. I think you need to tell about the erector set clutch you built when you're a kid. The what? The clutch, erector set clutch. Wasn't it a clutch that you built? That... Well never mind. If you don't remember it's a, not a no, good story. All I can remember is building chisel plows and tearing up the carpet in the house. <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> anyway. Well, let's, let's end with having each one of you tell a favorite memory from the farm, from the farm days. Mm. It's hard to pick one, but... I think it boils down to family. Having all our family together, and maybe a holiday or maybe just an incidental time. Really enjoying one another in an atmosphere that's quiet, and full of history. It's just a nice place to be. Um, my dad was much more relaxed than I am, and um, uh, and there were always a lot of friends and neighbors around here when I was growing up, and this is be Wade. Uh, Probably my dad's closest friend. Just getting around, uh, getting to hang around with all those old guys. We were talking as we drove over today that um, we tended to have many times visitors come in as a family, and when we went, it was as a family to someone else's family, not so much you know, mama having friends and. And daddy having friends that they necessarily socialized with apart Separate from the others, time. even though a lot of the men would come around the place, or if you went there while they were working, you'd get in the same sort of thing. But mm. but but we visited back and forth as a group, which I felt really enriched our lives. Carol, do you have a favorite? Oh, not one particular. I guess because I was away so much of the year, looking forward to coming home for the summer and being, I, I think ha having access to things grown in the garden was extra important to me, even though it was a lot of work and some that I got involved in too. It was, compared to institutional food, <laughs> it was delightful. <laughs> Nothing beats a homegrown tomato. Uh -huh.
You said my day of peanut butter. <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> Blackberry cobbler. Oh yeah, wow. that has to be right up there. <laughs> My wife is a retired home ec teacher, farm girl too. Anyway, uh, Dad would always talk about uh, his mom making him gooseberry pie, mm -hmm. and uh, and we never had any gooseberries. No, it took my wife probably six or eight years to finally come up with some fresh gooseberries. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, she made him a gooseberry pie. I missed that. It was awful. Well, the, really the, the, the thing that really cinched that was his mother had made a pie that was to be eaten for lunch I when the that. house yeah. went on yeah. fire. They had basically eaten their meal, but they hadn't gotten the gooseberry pie. And so that was something that was always in his mind. Yeah, that gooseberry I this, I the gooseberry pie burn up with yeah. that house. The last one. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll finish with the last question. And it's what you see for the farm the next 100 years. Hmm. Um. Odds are greater than 50% that I'm the last operator. Um, uh, I'm the only one that has children. And um, uh, two of my three kids are, uh, are very attached to the farm. Um, um, I don't know, if I hold on long enough, my oldest grandson's pretty mechanical. Oh, yeah. Um, but, that would be uh, something. I'm confident the farm will remain in the family because uh, uh, we're all financially comfortable enough that it just doesn't matter. And, the, and uh, that history uh, is significant to my kids. So I, I, think, uh, I think it will remain the family farm. Um, I'm... I'm uh, working uh, on a contingency plan with a neighbor that's uh, 20 years younger than me. And, uh, uh, we uh, were trying to develop a, uh, uh, some partnership to convert back to cattle again and him likely be the operator uh, uh, when I'm not able. But uh, I would presume and this, this Goins family has always been close to our family. Uh, this, this particular young man was probably one of the favorite neighbor kids to my folks. And, uh, there's a chance that, um, there's a chance that uh, uh, if I stay healthy enough, my son might come back and, uh, after his career. You know, but, um, there's probably going to be a, at least a gap in the operation, I would think. You have to find your house in Bonita, though. What's that? You have to find your house in Bonita. Oh, that's I pretty have nice. my house in Bonita. Mm -hmm. I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to get out of that house in Bonita. <laughs> Too many steps. <laughs> well, then, then they'll feel acreage would be primary trying to keep that in the same in the same shape. If they're doing a contingency plan, it would involve keeping the no till. No, no, uh, no, everybody else cares more about that than I do. I, I like to say, my motivation is economics. I don't really give a rip. He's thinking for history, if it's the oldest one, you'd want to uh, keep it'll, going with It'll it. be grass. It'll be grass probably in the next, I'm 55, it'll be grass within the next 10, 12 years. Uh, unless you convince me to, to uh, contribute it to extension for research. Uh, anyway, I, uh, I thought that crop production was going to come to an end here uh, four years ago. Um, that was kind of the plan at that point. Uh, I, uh, four years ago, I went to work for Votech uh, as the Ag Business Coordinator. And... Uh, the motivation was a little 
odd. Uh, this part needs to be edited out in case any of my neighbors read this. <laughs> but uh, uh, Votech approached me and I turned him down because it didn't pan out for me. They uh, didn't find who they wanted. They came back and figured out a way to make it pay significantly more and I had a lot of help. And, and uh, the issue was I had gone through uh, three expansions. One was intentional, two were accidental. And the last one, uh, uh, two times I'd, I'd come back to just farming what uh, the family and my wife and I owned. And the last time, uh, all, my, all our neighbors here started dying and retiring, and I ended up farming way more than I wanted to again. And uh, but I didn't have the heart to tell these neighbors that I didn't want to farm their land, so I, I went to work for Votech just as an excuse. I had three people working at the time, and the idea was they don't need me, and uh, I'll go do something fun, and that'll give me an excuse to get rid of all this rented land. And uh, that plan didn't work out very well. I, uh, all three of those guys left within months. And uh, so I've really had a struggle since then, but uh, 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 then I left Botech and went to the bank of Bonita. Uh, but at that point in 2006, uh, the intent was to start grassing everything down and get it back to cattle and, and uh, uh, be a bivocational operator. And uh, then all of a sudden crop production got really lucrative and so I stayed put and uh, and I prefer machinery and crops to livestock anyway but uh, when this bubble ends with with high priced crops then, then I'll start migrating back to beef cattle like I'd intended. Let's take it think ahead. Think ahead. Yeah but be willing to change path because it that will change. That's it. And we'll go ahead and thank you for your time. And it's been a pleasure reading and hearing your story. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you.